Hey. It's nice to see everyone. I think this is my third time at the conference. The first time was five years ago. I don't know. So it's nice to see so many faces. Actually, I'm not sure nice is exactly the right word. It's a bit intimidating, but anyway. So Polyhaven is a project I started, I think, around seven years ago. And we're going to go back in time a bit, and I want to explain the history of how it became what it is today. But before we get to that, let me tell you what it is today. So it is a platform where we create and publish high-resolution HDRIs, materials, and 3D models. And we give all of these away for free for everybody to do whatever they want with it. Thanks. So a few years ago, I got an email from Brecht, and he asked if we could put some of our HDRIs in Blender by default. So of course, I said yes. So those are all my HDRIs that are in Blender in the, in the shading settings. And if you look closely at the second HDRI, there is a dog. This is my Labrador. She, she died a couple of years ago, but it's really cool to see that she is sort of immortalized in Blender, that everybody gets to see her that way. Um, so we're a small company. We're based in South Africa. There's around 10 of us currently working, about half full-time artists and half contractors working on various things. Currently, we produce around an asset per day, but that's not exactly a, a target that we're trying to meet because we're focusing on quality HDRIs and textures and models, and we're not trying to meet some kind of publishing schedule. I think that's an easy mistake people try to make when they get started, is to try and meet some kind of deadline that they set themselves. So when I say the things we make are free, I don't just mean free that you can use them for specific things. I mean free that you can use them for literally anything you want. CC0 is the license we use. It basically removes the copyright from whatever you're publishing and allows anybody to do anything that they want. So if you're a hobbyist making a render, you don't have to worry about how you have to give us credit. If you're a film person or somebody working on a game, you don't have to worry about getting the legal team involved to decide how you're allowed to use these and if you can publish them. Or if you're a researcher making a machine learning algorithm, you know that you have a large data set that you can use freely and you don't have to worry about licensing issues down the road. So of course, there are downsides to us making everything so free. Um, some people will abuse this freedom in a way that benefits themselves, but in the end of the day, we don't really mind that. We think that the benefit that we have, that we give to the industry as a whole, is going to outweigh that. So it's okay. <laughs> um, this is the question everybody asks me, is, is why the heck are you doing this? Why do you give everything free, away for free? So uh, I guess this is my story. Around seven years ago, I was a lighting and shading artist in a studio, and I started to get interested in making HDRIs. And back then, all the HDRIs that were available were either low resolution or they were clipped. So clipping is where you don't actually capture the HDRI correctly, and the lighting it produces is not realistic. Uh, there were paid HDRIs that were a little higher quality, but the stuff that was actually good cost you several hundred dollars per image, so I couldn't really use it, and I wanted to create my own. Now, from the beginning, I always, I wanted to give everything that I made away for free. I was always interested in Blender and inspired by that whole philosophy, but I was afraid that I couldn't make that work. I didn't know how I could give everything away for free and still make a living and survive. And I didn't know what the future of my career was, where I was going. So I was scared. So instead, I decided to create a website where I sold HDRIs. In the beginning, I sold HDRIs in bundles using Gumroad for around $5 each or in a bundle for cheaper. But I also gave away the full, the low resolution version of the HDRI for free directly on the website. So the website is an interesting part of the journey because at the time, I couldn't find any WordPress templates I could use, and I obviously didn't have the money to hire somebody to develop something more custom, so I ended up figuring it out, and I guess that's the theme of my life, is I have to figure everything out myself, which is fun, and then I built this website that I ran for about a year, and towards the end of that year, I started experimenting with 
giving away the full resolution HDRIs for free just to see what would happen. And I still didn't know how to host these giant files. If you know HDRI is the, the full resolution, they're quite big. I don't know how to host them free. So I put them on Gumroad. And Gumroad forces anybody to put an email address before you can actually download a file. And I didn't really like this. I don't like buying something with my personal information, but I didn't really have much choice, so I was okay with it. And in the end, that little detail of getting people's email addresses turned out to be quite important for our early success. So after about a year of running this website, I decided I still wanted to give away everything for free. And now that I'd been doing it for a little while, I started to try and figure out, maybe I could actually do it, maybe I could afford it, but what would that actually cost? So I worked out that it might cost me $750 a month to run the website and give me a little bit of budget to travel to shoot more HDRI. So this was the target of what I wanted to earn through donations in order to continue to survive. Then, I tried to work out what is the chance that somebody will just give you money for no reason. And uh, it's, I thought I had no idea, so I just, okay, maybe half a percent. I think there's a lot of resources out there with sales. It's maybe one to two to five percent, depending on what you're doing. But for donations, maybe much less. So if everybody was giving me five dollars and per month, and it was half a percent of the people who could see the website who would do that, that would mean I'd need an audience of about 30,000 people. So I thought that's achievable. So what I started doing is instead of focusing on growing my profit like every business does, I started focusing on growing my audience. And this was really easy. All you have to do is give things away for free and people love you, and it works. So pretty much immediately, I saw that this was gonna work out and I started to strategize, strategize how I could incentivize people to support me. The first way is using reward tiers, where people get something in return for their donations. This is a bit of a slippery slope. It starts to look a lot like a subscription service, and that's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted this to be more like a reward for helping me. So what you can try to do is make sure that your rewards are not that significant. It's more of a uh, superficial value, like credit of your name on the website or next to your favorite asset and maybe a link to your portfolio. And the other thing is things that are convenience, where our assets are free, but if you support us, we make it a little bit more convenient for you to be able to use it. So recently we created a plugin that puts all of our assets inside of the new asset browser, which works amazing. The other thing you can do is funding goals, which is sort of like a continuously evolving Kickstarter, where if I reach, if people support us with a certain amount of donations per month, then we can start to afford this. Maybe hiring another person for creating more textures. So after a couple of months, we met the goal of the 30,000 people in our audience, and I decided to make the switch from selling HDRIs to giving them away for free. And to my surprise, it actually worked really well. People actually liked what we were doing enough that they wanted to help us. And nobody, <laughs> people were always very shocked that I, I wanted to give things away for free and I thought that would work, but it turns out it actually works pretty well. And we blew through the first few funding goals and soon enough, I was actually starting to have to promise because of the funding goals to make more HDRIs than I actually had time for. And that meant, well, I had to use those funds to hire people. So the strategy for hiring people was to find people around the world so that we could get a good variety of environments of different textures and that the weather would be more various. In South Africa, our winters are very <laughs> boring. They're lovely, they're warm. It's, it doesn't even feel like winter sometimes, but it's just sunny every day and it gets boring. So. While this was happening, I started working with Rob, and we decided to work on a similar site called Texture Haven, where we made, just like the HDRIs, we made textures, or Rob made textures, and released them for free, and it was supported by a Patreon model. And 
this was always a completely separate project. I happened to be involved in making the website and look kind of similar, but it was a separate thing with its own funding and we weren't really trying to collaborate on any big projects. But it worked pretty well and it was fairly successful. But as you can imagine, the first thing that people do when they see HDRI's textures, they think, why don't you do the same for 3D models? You know, it's, it's like the obvious next step. Why haven't you done it already? But I think I always knew that 3D models were a lot more work to make good. They took more time. We wouldn't have as much, and I wasn't sure it would work. But eventually, I applied for a grant from Epic Games. And when we eventually got that grant, I decided we should give it a try. So we made 3D Model Haven. And using the funding from the grant, we could get started with a few dozen models on the site. But this was in early 2020. So when the pandemic hit, my partner, who was working on the, the content for the site, again, it was a separate thing where I was just doing the website and my partner was doing the models. His priorities changed, and it kind of became stale. We didn't have the budget from the support from the Patreon to continue to create models. We just had enough from the grant to get it started. Now, around this time, our only income was from Patreon, people donating to us. And it was really good. I was really happy with it. It was comfortable. It was growing steadily. But I'm not really the kind of person to just leave well enough alone. I, uh, does anybody here have a, a website where you have your email publicly listed on the site? You probably get emails like this. People promising, if you just put a few little like giant video ads on your site, then you will get lots of money. So every now and then, some emails like this would slip through the cracks, and I would never do something like this. But it got me inspired. Maybe I should look into it. Maybe it's something we could do. Now, I hate ads. I have an ad blocker, probably like most of you, on all of my devices, my computer, my TV, my phone. I haven't seen an ad in like two years. So if I was going to put ads on my website that I'd spent years of my life working on, there would have to be some boundaries in place. So they had to be tasteful, it had to be worth doing, and the people who were paying my bills would have to approve of the idea, the supporters on Patreon. So that was where I started. I made a poll on Patreon to ask if everybody was okay with that idea. And we would do it as a three-month trial, where we would put ads on the website for three months and evaluate after that if it was okay. And it turns out most people are okay with ads as long as they are unobtrusive, and as long as there is a way for our supporters to turn them off if they wanted to. So we went ahead with that. And what happened was we started earning almost as much from the ad revenue as we did from the Patreon donations. And that meant we had doubled the income of the overall company overnight. But already, we had too much money for just HDRIs. There's so, only so many skies that you can shoot. So what made sense? was to combine the three sites together, to share that income to create more textures and 3D models and not so much HDRIs. So that's what we did, I believe, in late 2020 or early 2021. We hired two 3D artists to create 3D models for the new site where we would merge it together, and then we did that. So it's not exactly the smoothest journey, but that is how Polyhaven got started. Obviously, that is not the end of the story. That is the beginning of the story. That's how we got started. The challenge was no longer how to make it work, because it was working. The challenge was how to make it grow. Now, there's not a lot of organizations like Polyhaven, people giving things away for free. It's weird. But if you think about it, there is an organization like us, and that's the Blender Foundation. So a lot of what we do is inspired by the business model from the Blender Foundation's relationship with the studio and the institute and this kind of hybrid, non-profit, for-profit design, I guess. So one of the things we started doing early on with Polyhaven was working with corporate sponsors to see if we could get companies to support our work. Now, just like with Blender, the industry benefits from Blender being open source. There's a lot of companies who can do a lot of interesting things to make them money because of Blender. And I think for us, it's a similar thing where we create assets that are good and useful in a lot of different ways, and some companies can benefit. So that's what we started to look at. 
One of those applications is uh, AI and machine learning, where because of our data set is so big and useful, you can use it to train a machine learning model to do all sorts of interesting things. And obviously there's film and visual effects and AAA studios for games, and getting them to support us is one of my current goals, and totally not the reason why I'm here. So I think what we're trying to do is difficult. Anybody can make free assets and put them on the internet. That's easy. You can open Blender, export the default cube, and put it on the internet. That's an asset. But then it has to be free to use for everybody, for any purpose, not just non-commercially, not with attribution. I have nothing against that. But what we're trying to do is absolute freedom, including freedom to share. If you want to create a scene and then share that scene with others, you should be able to do that. And then obviously we want them to be actually good because nobody wants to use the default cube. So along with creating free assets, we're trying to share our knowledge of how we create the assets. So a few years ago, I made an article about how I make HDRIs. It's very long and very technical. But I wanted to share how I did it because in the beginning, nobody really knew what they were doing, and I had to figure out most of it myself. Recently, Rico made a similar article about our texture scanning process. And that was also really interesting to see technically how we take uh, 400 photos and then turn that into a material you can use in Blender seamlessly. And next year, we're also going to be working on some training material for 3D models that's not super well covered on YouTube already. I know the Blender tutorial space is huge, so we're not trying to do what everybody else is doing. We want to maybe cover things that are more difficult and more specific. The other thing we started doing is community projects, where we work with our community, or you, everybody, to create a scene at the moment. And then we get a few sponsors to sponsor prizes to encourage participation, uh, various plugins and tools and assets. And this was, of course, inspired by the Sintel modeling sprint. So Sintel is, what does that say, 2010, 12 years old. And at the time, I wasn't really good enough to participate in this, where making this Intel Open movie, I'm sure you've heard of it, they asked the community to assist with making props for the movie. And I thought that was a really cool idea, and that stuck with me, and that's what I want to try and do, because it's, it's fun to work with the community. So working with the community and people publishing assets on Polyhaven means free assets for everyone. And free assets for everyone, if you make something and share it on Polyhaven, that gives you some exposure. But even if it's not good enough to publish on Polyhaven, then we give you critique and feedback on what you can do to improve. But if it is accepted, then more assets on Polyhaven means a bigger asset library. A bigger asset library means more attention to Polyhaven. More attention to Polyhaven means more funding. And more funding means more assets for everyone. It's this kind of positive feedback loop that results in free CC0 assets for everybody to use. So at the same time, we started sharing how we actually build the website. If you remember, one of the uh, stumbling blocks in the beginning for me was figuring out how to actually publish these giant files for free on my website. And that's kind of why I started selling them instead of giving them away for free, because I didn't know how to do this. So I started sharing how we handle a lot of data, how much it costs, what our expenses are, and all the source code for the website as well. So what does this mean? Like, what is this for? It's been seven years. And we've been sharing our assets, and our knowledge, and our code, and our business model. And at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is inspire people to do the same thing, to give what they create away for free for everybody. But doing that in a way that is sustainable long term is very difficult. So I have five pro tips on how to actually make that work. And first is to treat it like a business, even if you don't want to. You have to think about money, because you need money to live. It's, you're not doing this for the money. That's not the motivation. But you know that you need money to keep going, especially to keep going long term. 
So that means you have to think about goals and conversion rates and all sorts of business things like that. And then optimizing your infrastructure to be cost effective. So one of the things about having a donation driven business is that it's very expensive. And that means you have to be very careful about where you use your money and try and find unique solutions. That also means you need to be very transparent about your money, because this is not really your money anymore. You need to make sure that every expense that you have is communicated and people can trust that you're using their donations effectively. The second tip is to stay human and don't treat it too much like a business. There has to be a kind of a balance. You don't want to come across as some kind of corporate entity because nobody wants to donate money to Adobe. They don't need money. <laughs> They're donating money to you personally. So you have to make sure that you stay a person and you don't become a robot or an AI. And communicate all the decisions that you make and make sure that probably, preferably communicate them before you make the decision so that you can get feedback from your supporters and see what they say. And in the end, treat it like it's still their money, not like yours. If you get I don't know, a bunch of money, don't go buy a Ferrari. That's not why they're giving you their money. Third is that this only works at scale. And this is a bit of a sad one. You can't create, you can't make a long-term sustainable business from something that is too specific and too niche. You'd think, okay, so the conversion rate for normal online sales may be one to 3%, like I said earlier. And in the beginning, I thought, okay, maybe half a percent, a lot less than that. At the end of the day, it's a lot less than that. It's two hundredths of a percent of the visitors to our website will support us on Patreon. And the reason that that works is just because of the scale of what we're doing. It's very applicable to a lot of people. And if it wasn't that, if it was more specific and niche, then it wouldn't work. So it has to be appealing to a lot of audience. And finally, some just general good advice is to specialize and focus on what you're good at. Don't try to be a jack of all trades and master of none. Just do one thing really, really well. Build a reputation for that one thing. And then later you can always think about expanding. You don't have to jump right in the deep end and do a bajillion things. And finally, don't stay comfortable. I think maybe this is just who I am. Some people it's okay to be comfortable and to get used to something and then cruise on the rest of your life. But for me, I like to get used to failing, to trying new things all the time. And a lot of those things are not gonna work. But that's okay, that's fine. As long as you communicate what you're trying and when you fail, why you failed and learn from it, that's a good thing. Because you might just actually succeed, which is fun when that happens, especially when you fail 10 times in a row. So yeah, that's pretty much how Polyhaven works. We've shared everything we have, all of our assets and our knowledge and our code and our business model. So I hope that inspires some of you here to try something similar or to join us on creating open assets for everyone. Thanks.